What I like to teach instead of coming from resistance is selling equals service. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business Podcast, a project of the P-Tex Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the P-Tex headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, this is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome back my good friend and past guest of the Let's Talk Business Summits, Eric Lawfam. Eric is a master sales trainer who has taught his proven sales system to thousands of professionals around the world. He is the president and CEO of Eric Lafam International, an organization he founded to professionally train people on the art of science of selling. Eric has been teaching people how to make more sales since 1999. In our interview, Eric discusses the transformational sales triangle, discovering how to master your mindset Redefining your techniques and taking consistent action can revolutionize your sales game. Now, I know some of you are feeling stuck in your sales career. Eric reveals his secrets to overcoming negative beliefs and mindset objections. Learn how catching and replacing unuseful thoughts can create significant shifts in your sales success. This and so much more only on the Let's Talk Business Podcast. Let's get right to our conversation with Eric Lafon. Now, before we get into the conversation itself, I want to ask you for a favor. If you enjoy the show, regardless if you're listening on audio or YouTube video, please subscribe to the show and at the same time, leave a review. By leaving a review or subscribing to the show, you're telling the algorithm that you love the show and other people like you should also enjoy the show. That's a little bit I could ask for the content that we're putting out. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Eric Lafon. Eric, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business Podcast. I'm excited to be here. The last time we spoke is at our Let's Talk Business Summit in 2013, which was the first of all the summits we have we have started in this series. And actually, this was the beginning of the whole Let's Talk Business platform, including this podcast. So... We had you that show. It was amazing. Um, you shared a stage with Gary V and other, um, you know, brand names, so to speak, in the in the business world. And it, we had a blast. And since then, we kept up. Maybe not speaking to each other, but I kept on following what you get, what you're doing. And I, you know, what I like about you is um, consistency. You 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 know, you started at that time and sp- speaking about sales, and. All these years later, you're still in sales, so I'm so happy you're able to to make it and speak to our audience about sales. Yeah, it's great to be here and great to reconnect. I remember that event in New York. It was a great event. Uh, I'm excited to be here and and share some ideas. I've been doing this now in my 26th year teaching sales, and so I love it. You know, things have changed quite a bit with technology and social media, uh, but the core principles are still the same. Exactly. So we'll get to that. But before we, we dabble into the specifics of sales, um, for our audience that weren't at the event or never heard about you, I want to start with your story because um, the first things I read when before I, before we get on an interview, obviously I knew you from before, is the, the way the guest um, puts together their bio. And, and literally, because that's, that shows a little bit of what, what's going on in their life to a certain extent. In your case, um, what caught my eye is the part where you mentioned that you started with a failure in sales. And that became like the pivotal moment to become what, um, the expert, you know, the expert in sales that you are today. So for our listeners, give us that story and let's set the tone for our conversation. Yeah. Well, my first year in sales, uh, I was the bottom producer on my sales team. I missed the quota, which was 10,000 a month in gross sales, two months in a row. And they wrote me up. They said, Eric, you've got one more month to hit your quota or you're out. (laughs) Selling isn't for everybody, Eric. It's probably not for you. And so my back was against the wall. And uh, I met a man named Dr. Donald Moyne, who's a brilliant sales trainer. And he taught me a sales system. And I hit the quota by one sale that next month. So I got to keep my job. And then the month after that, I did five times quota and I became the top producer in my division. And I've never looked back. I've gone on to do millions and millions of dollars in sales. And what I learned from that experience is that selling is a learned skill. So everybody listening to this right now, regardless of how good or beginner you are, you can get better. And I'm living proof of that. 
So what, what changed? What was that pivotal moment? So is it a mindset? Is it the actual, uh, you know, practical skill that you learned? Yeah, it started with how to put together an effective sales presentation. So I had never been trained. We did not have a good training program. When I started at that company, they just said, here's your leads, go make sales. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. And when I met Dr. Boyne, he shared with me how to lay out an effective sales presentation. And now I teach that as an outline called Sales Mountain, which is the outline of an effective presentation. So I learned how to sequence the presentation. I learned how to put together an effective close, how to handle objections. And once I was properly trained, my sales took off. So I, I want to dive deeper into what you just said. And I think uh, a lot of our listeners could attest to that is sometimes, you know, your first job is, you are you know, you're thinking of what am I good at? What should I do? And all of a sudden a sales opportunity comes uh, comes upon you. You said, you know, let me try it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you could speak to someone three months, six months in and he said, no, not working. I'm moving on. And sometimes I'll, I'll have that conversation, a 15 minute conversation with a person saying, you know what, what's not working? Is it the product you're selling? Is it a company you're selling for? Is it the type of sales inbound versus outbound? Or is it a skill that you're missing in sales? And sometimes that's a light bulb moment. Why? Because you could see people exiting the sales arena for the wrong reasons. They're born salespeople. They could be great at sales. And all of a sudden, because they, they fell into the wrong company or they weren't trained properly in the, get, in the early stages, all of a sudden they fall out of the process. So I appreciate you starting off with this way. And I think our listeners, anybody that's listening to this, regardless if you're directly in sales or indirectly in sales, we're all in sales one way or the other. So it's important to pay attention to um, to what we're going to be discussing today. So I want to go there for a couple of minutes and, and explain to me, um, now that you're training salespeople, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, which comes, is this the understanding the industry and understanding the pain points and so on and so forth? Is the sales presentation and it's your people skills? What are the, the mechanics of a good salesperson? I teach it, uh, I call it the sales transformational triangle. And that's inner game, outer game, action. Inner game deals with mindset, belief systems, belief in your company, belief in yourself, belief in your product, uh, confidence, that's inner game. Outer game is the how-to techniques. Every how-to technique can be learned. And then the third component is action. It is getting out there and doing enough, whether it's prospecting or running enough appointments or whatever your whatever action you need to be taking. And so I focus on all three of those. Could we go, go a little deeper into those three categories? Sure. So inner game, one way of thinking about it is the position that we're coming from. And a lot of people out there in business resist selling. And they're like, I don't like sales. I'm not good at sales. I don't want to be salesy. I don't want to be pushy, et cetera. And so they go into a presentation where they're, they're trying to influence somebody to buy a product, book an appointment, whatever they're trying to influence them to do, but they're coming from a position of resistance. And so what I like to teach instead of coming from resistance is selling equals service. Yeah. So my mindset is I'm going to serve the person that's in front of me all day long. So right now you're in front of me. So I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve your audience. When this presentation's done, I'll go to my next whatever I'm up to. And I have to look at my schedule. So if I'm coaching, I'm going to serve that person. If I'm selling, selling equals service. I'm going to serve that person by selling. In other words, I'm going to explain the benefits of the product or service as that's my way of serving. So the inner game it so much of it has to do with the position that we're coming from. And nowadays with social media, some people come from a position of, well, I don't like how I look on video or I'm not good at LinkedIn or I don't do technology or I don't do email marketing. I hate uh, cold calls. <laughs> there you go. I hate cold calls. <laughs> I, I'm uncomfortable asking for the order. I don't ask for what I want. In my way of looking at the world, all of that's inner game. That's all mindset. I'm in control of my thoughts. I'm the only person that can change my thoughts. So if I don't like how I look on video, I'm the only one that can change that thought. And that thought is our, our language creates. So what that means is it, it doesn't just communicate, it also creates. So if I say I don't like how I look on video, I'm not gonna do very many videos. And right now we're on video and I'm, I'm fine on video, but if I 
was coming from I don't like how I look on video. And then I found out we were on video today. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. <laughs> Correct. It's all mental. So I love to help people explore the thinking that they have that's creating the type of results that's, that's showing up in the real world. Now, let me ask you, um, how does someone um, overcome mindset objections? Yeah, so one of my mentors taught me to catch my thoughts. And he calls them unuseful thoughts. So start noticing when you're saying, I don't deserve success. I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm not good over the phone at selling. Talked to a client the other day. He's like, I'm not good on Zoom for <laughs> one-on-one sales. I have to go be with people. Well, the problem with that is now, you, in some cases, you got to drive an hour, meet with the person, drive an hour back. So one hour appointment takes you three hours. You could run three appointments on Zoom. So it's catching the thoughts and knowing if my thought is I don't, I'm not good on Zoom, that's going to create a certain way. And now we can replace those thoughts. And it's it literally is the position that we're coming from and to realize I can get good at Zoom. Zoom is a learned skill. I can get good at asking for referrals. I can learn Instagram. I can learn email marketing. I can learn whatever the case may be, whatever skill set it is. And so it's having an optimistic view and understanding, in in my view, optimism is a learned skill. I think you're touching a very important point is, and this is negative beliefs in general in life, and this is, we're talking about sales, but sometimes you, you have that negative belief and it doesn't take a lot and you start believing yourself on that. And all of a sudden you're creating that roadblock for yourself. Like you see it a lot with sales and uh, salespeople, and you probably could have um, ha- had it a gazillion times in your career where a sales, you you would watch a salesperson or hear a salesperson. Why are you not picking that phone? You know why are you not picking up that phone call and making that phone call? And he said, "I think they went with another vendor, or I think they wouldn't like. They they probably don't need the product. You know, you're giving excuses what potentially the other person should should be doing. And chances are, fifty percent they will or they won't. But now you're getting that negative belief before even you pick up that phone call. Just be, and that's creating that fear of, of actually doing the action. So that comes back to mindset? Yes, and we can shift it because most people in sales acknowledge that they should be doing more prospecting. And they know that, and they're not doing it because of fear of rejection. Fear of rejection is anticipating how the other person's gonna respond. So I don't play that game. <laughs> the game I play is I'm gonna reach out to 25 people today. And I'm going to acknowledge when I reach out to one person and when I book the appointment, it's a double win. I win or I double win. I win no matter what. So I'm not thinking about how this other person is going to respond. And this gives me tremendous confidence. Uh, It took me 10 years to figure that out. And I, I prospected with anxiety for over a decade because I didn't understand the anxiety was coming from anticipating how the other person was going to respond. And if I stopped doing that and I acknowledge the activity, it literally shifted everything for me. Yeah. And I think, I think it's, it's so important because at the end of the day, you cannot control if that person will buy from you or not. That's right. What you could control is your action. And I think salespeople have to know that the only thing you control is your action. And then as long as you're giving yourself negative beliefs and all of a sudden that's lingering you from doing the action, there's no chance that the other person is buying from you. Yeah, if you don't try, <laughs> if you don't put yourself out there, it's going to be a no. You know, I mean, for, for today's podcast, I had my, um, my assistant reach out to you. And then out of reaching out, you're like, oh, yeah, hey, let's have Eric on the podcast, right? So, yep. Had we not reached out, we wouldn't be here right now. And then whoever's listening to this wouldn't be listening to it. So the mindset, when I had my assistant reach out, I probably told them, I want you to reach out to 50 people today. And I gave him a list of the people and you were one of the people. And so, you know, he probably got one to 40 yeses and the other 46 to 49 people said no or didn't respond. But here we are. Exactly. Exactly. It's actually a, it's a it's a good sales lesson over here because that's exactly how it happened. So let's talk about um, you know some of the practical tips and in, in some of the the trade of, of 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 a good salesperson. And I want to start with this is something that I hear so many times, where a salesperson would go to a lead, they will come back and how was it? And he says, "Amazing, we had such a great conversation," or something along the lines, and then they cannot take it to the finish line. What is that salesperson doing wrong or 
what is this something if you would coach such a salesperson in the process to understand where they really are? Yeah, so I would start off with pre-presentation, getting a clear outcome of what's the result that I want to have happen from this presentation. So do I want to book the next appointment? Do I want to get the contract signed? Do I want to get an initial order? Do I want to get a credit card? So what's the outcome? And then I'm going to craft my presentation in advance. So I'm going to walk in. I'm going to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, why to say it. So then if the person comes back and I say, well, what was the, the clear outcome? And they're like, well, I didn't have one. Or what was the clear outcome? The outcome was to close the sale. Okay, what happened at the end when you, you offered your product or service? Oh, we didn't get to that part. Okay, well, <laughs> your job is to go in and execute the plan and you didn't ask for the order. So I'd have to diagnose it with them on an individual basis. What was the goal in advance? What were you trying to do? What was the, tell me how you, you prepared the presentation and then tell me what the result was. And from that, I could diagnose it. I'm a big believer in stage selling. And stage selling means sell the prospect to the next step. So at the end of the first date, we don't say, will you marry me? <laughs> okay, that's not the next step. So I just, I've, I just sell to the next step. And I just make it really simple. And that, that's one of my core philosophies that's really served me. So let me ask you a follow-up on that. It's a very important point because there's like, let's say if this is a larger sale, let's say you, you are a software developer and this is going to be a six-month project and there's a, so many decision makers that need to be part of the process and discovery and so on and so forth. If you don't know the stages, you're going to go back and forth between stages and, and constantly not knowing exactly where you are. If you know in a typical sale, these are the stages now you could come back in the office and discuss it with your team and saying, you know what, I think, check, this this stage was done. Now it's convincing the partner. So now it's convincing the, the IT professionals, whatever it is. And you could go from stage to stage versus running from, from one stage to the other. S speaking about stage, uh, stages, do you have an issue if, let's say, and I've seen it a lot with certain companies that are very, about, you know, very particular about their staging and therefore... They're not allowing. They're not allowing you to jump ahead, and if you see the lead jumps ahead, the salesperson gets so annoyed because <laughs> they're following a, a process, and you're actually getting them all mixed up. What's your What's your response to that? Is that are you? Do you have to change your staging or the process based on the lead? I had a um, CEO of a company. His name is Greg Mazzillo. And he runs a company called Performa. They do about five hundred million a year. So he's he's a big deal. And he contacted me because he got my book off of Amazon, and he's looking for a keynote speaker at his upcoming conference. So I would normally take somebody through several steps. You know, it's a fifteen twenty thousand dollars sale. So the initial call, I'm talking to him, and um, I'm trying to take him through my process, trying to book the next appointment. And he's just like, bottom line, it I I need to know what the cost is, and he wanted, he was like ready to make a decision and I want to do a three step, you know, three call, three calls and then ask him for the order. And so fortunately I listened to him and I just got right to the point. Okay, fine. Here's the bottom line. And he hired me and we ended up doing several deals together and he did not want to go through my process. And so fortunately I was listening and I didn't force him to. So generally speaking, I'm going to take somebody through my process, but he was further along in, in the way his mind thinks about making a buying decision. And maybe from a time management standpoint, because he's such a successful guy, he didn't want to do a bunch of appointments. He just wanted to find a speaker and hire him. Got it. Yeah. So the, so, so the lesson there is that sometimes you have to adapt based on who you're speaking to. So you can't follow the script to the T. And However, what I will mention is if you have a process because that's the only way where the person will see the value or if, if you're not going to if you're going to skip that process, it might come back to bite you later. And once the person is actually a client of yours, then chances are you got to you got you to gotta do that. So, for instance, in the creative space or software development, if they'll rush to a decision and then three months into the project, they say, oh, I thought this is included, not included. Or I thought you're giving me this, this consultancy in the side. Or no, that's an add on, whatever it is. And that will be part of your process. It's important that that's communicated before the sale. Absolutely. Got it. So um, let me ask you, you've, you've dealt with so many salespeople throughout the years. Is there a type of person that you would say, you know, my friend sales is not for you? 
it depends on the type of sales you're doing. But, you know, a lot of sales does require the prospecting. It requires resistance. It requires dealing with no's. And um, not everybody wants to do that. You know, there are other professions out there. My, my sister's a nurse. She comes to work, whether she has a great attitude or not so great attitude or having a bad day or a great day, she gets paid the same. She doesn't have to go get the patients. She just shows up at the hospital or the clinic, wherever she is. So there's nothing that requires her to go out and, and hunt, if you will. And so, you know, she's a great nurse. My dad was a phenomenal pharmacist, and that was a great profession, you know, for, for, for both of them. For me, I, I like the freedom of sales. Um, I'm, I lean into the challenge of selling. I'm open to it. So it comes down to somebody's goals. What kind of money do they want to make? If they weren't in sales, what are their options? You know, do they have good options? Can they make, if they want to make six figures, could they do it outside of sales? You know, I'm a college dropout, so I don't have a lot of options outside of sales. You know, it's, it's what I do. And um, fortunately for me, sales does not require uh, any type of, you know, schooling, at least the type of selling that I do. So it really just depends on the individual and their goals and their willingness to deal with a no. So speaking about the no, um, what type of advice could you give um, a person listening to this uh, and, and saying, you know what, sometimes when I get that no, it just kills me and I cannot pick myself up? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's falling in love with the process. So if you, if you listen to Tom Brady talk, you know, he won all the Super Bowls and he never talked about, well, you know, that was what our focus was, was winning the Super Bowl. The focus was on the process. And if they did the, the details great, they were going to have overall success. And so in selling, you could prospect to generate a lead. You could book an appointment. You could deliver a wonderful presentation. And they still didn't buy. And a salesperson could be feel deflated when they did everything great. And instead of feeling deflated, I would tell them to acknowledge themselves. I would tell them to be their, their number one cheerleader. So I don't have to make a sale to acknowledge myself. Right. And sometimes you need 10 good things to happen in order to close the sale. And you do nine of them and you don't close it, but you, you know, you did great. You know, especially when you're putting yourself out there, you know, if we acknowledge ourselves, we're more likely to do it. So, you know, I would just check in. Did I give good, good effort? Did I deliver a quality sales presentation? Did I ask for the order if they had a need for my product or service and were qualified? If the answer is yes, then I want to acknowledge that. And I'm going to get my fair share of yeses. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. Like if you if you have enough prospects, you have enough leads, and you do the proper follow up, there's a certain percentage. You know, obviously, we're talking about a product that there are there's a need out there. Yeah, you know, I know that in 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 your company, Aeroglyphim International, you you focus a lot on the sales training and, and and structuring the sales process, and I know that you focus on the art and the science of uh, of of selling. Explain the difference between the art and the science, and how they those two come together. Yeah. So that one example with Greg Mozillo, you know, that would very much be art, right? <laughs> you're in the moment, you're being present. I had to, you know, pivot away from my system. And sometimes it's, it's doing that, you know, when we're, there's a type of prospecting, I'll call it a nurture touch, where I'm going to reach out to somebody, you know, checking in on them, caring about them, maybe acknowledging, hey, I saw your on social media, your son got into that, that college that, you know, you must be proud. I saw your son just graduated or your daughter just graduated. That's, that's like the art. Cause you wouldn't think, Oh, I'm going to, you know, reach out and talk about something that has nothing to do with business as part of how I'm going to communicate with this person. And then the science of it is just, you know, what's the system? How do I message somebody on uh, LinkedIn? What's the template that I'm following? What's the script that I'm following? What's the What's the process? What's the outline? What's the sequencing? How many times should I follow up before I give up? <laughs> you know, before I move on? How do you, you know, play in your day in writing? What's the the science of that? And so there's um, there's a lot of science to business, and that you know you start looking at like social media with the algorithms. <clears throat> that's all you know a, a scientific way of looking at things. Um, so that that's that's to me what the two things are. Yeah, just you speaking about science and about um, when to reach out. I remember I was once in an event and there was a sales trainer speaking 
there was a couple of uh, questions after he spoke, and one of the guys came up and asked, um, do you believe that um, emailing people on Monday morning is a good idea for sales or not a good idea? And the person thinks for a second, he says, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but you're probably not a good salesperson. And he says, what do you mean? He says, depending on who that person is. If he told you a Thursday, please follow up beginning of the week, you're following up on Monday. If it's a cold outreach, maybe you're not following up on Monday. So it really it's the science of understanding where you are in the process of knowing if you should follow up or not. It stuck with me that like, the way he responded. Um, so, so in terms of, I want to I want to pivot the conversation to a, a very important topic. So, so a lot of companies you could see even smaller companies or uh, particular smaller companies, you would start off where the one of the partners or the, the entrepreneur is the salesperson beginning. And then at one point, they they want to remove themselves from sales and then all of a sudden they're hiring the first salesperson, second salesperson. What ends up happening that the owner or the, the original salesperson, let's call him, becomes a, the sales trainer or the, you know, the sales manager, let's call it. And a lot of times I've seen that it's not working out as well because they might have been a great salesperson, but sales managing, sales, um, sales training is a totally different skill. So for our listeners, first of all, give us your opinion about, in general, the difference between a salesperson and a sales manager and sales trainer in responsibilities. And then what would be the, the criteria of a person that could lead into that position versus somebody that might not be the best fit? Well, as a... A salesperson, I'm responsible for producing. As a manager, I'm overseeing somebody else and I'm supporting them in producing. And you're talking about somebody who found they're a founder of a company and now they grow it to the point where they're no longer the main salesperson, or even if they are, they're they're adding on these other salespeople. Those salespeople oftentimes are not going to have nearly the same motivation, the same self starter, <laughs> the same work ethic. And when you're hiring a salesperson, I'm just thinking about the, the person on my team, his name is Kevin. I have to think like Kevin. I have to think, you know, what's important to him? What's going on in, in his world? And when I'm selling, I don't have to think at all about <laughs> Kevin, right? And so it's not necessarily intuitive to be like, for example, compensation. How much are you going to pay the person? Right. And, oh, I'm going to pay him straight commission. All right. Well, how's that going to work when Kevin or whoever your person is comes in and starts working with you and they're on straight commission and they're starting, they're, they're with you for a couple of weeks and they're having some doubts. Is this going to work out or not? So now mentally they're, they're starting to think, oh, I got to get a, a, a backup plan. So we got to have the compensation thought through. We got to have what type of leads are they going to have? How easy is this going to be for the salesperson? So one of the, the systems that we, we actually implemented today, very first time, is um, text marketing. And it's to our own existing database. So people that are in my database, people like yourself, we're going to start sending text to book appointments. And so we did that today. And all the inbound traffic that came in off of our texting went to my sales rep, Kevin. Well, he's excited about that because that's easy <laughs> compared to having to like call through the database, right? And so I want to make things as easy as possible so Kevin feels supported, so he's all in, so he's not out looking for some other opportunity. And it took me many, many years to figure that out, to think, really put myself in the mind of this person. How am I going to train him? How am I going to motivate him? How am I going to compensate them? What type of leads are they going to have? to find that right fit so they can make my job easier, you know, and help drive the revenue of the company. So it is a very different way of thinking. And uh, the motivation of the salesperson is probably not going to be the same as the owner. Yeah. So sometimes I would even see somebody which is a great sales trainer um, and they can't even like, they, they don't even like doing sales on their own. They, they don't like, they like the leading part and the emotional support part of, of sales training and sales uh, managing, but not necessarily being a, a salesperson directly. Now, what would you say from a sales manager? Like I know that there's also the part of the strategy of selling, the sales process, sales systems, these things usually fall on, on, on sales man, the sales manager as well, correct? Yeah. And um, I mean, one, one interesting thing about the sales person versus sales manager, if you think about Phil Jackson, who used to be the coach of Michael Jordan, 
And then he was the coach of uh, Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant. He won all the championships. Not a very good basketball player. Uh, he was a bench player for the Knicks, yet some people think he's the greatest coach ever. So coaching or managing is different skill set than selling. And nowadays, I'll just speak for my business, technology is playing an ever-increasing role in the sales process. Also, another thing is content creation, what we're doing right now, right? Creating content is a way of um, generating new leads, building relationships with people, furthering relationships with people in your existing uh, in your existing network. And so thinking through content strategy and then how does technology integrate with your sales process? And, and there's lots of things that I'm doing in, in my organization right now in order to you know, keep up with the times, if you will, and uh, it, you know, to be able to leverage all this great technology that's out there. Nice. I know that you're currently working on a mid-year and annual planning class. Um, tell us more about what that is all about. Yeah. So back in 2003, I got this idea. It was December of that year. And I thought, I bet some of my clients would like to do some goal setting and planning for the new year. Because if you think about every December, you know, people like you and I, we get excited about the new year and getting those goals set. And so I started doing a class every December and now we used to charge for it. Now we do it for free. And then I thought, well, why don't we also do it in the middle of the year? So every June and every December, my community, that everybody, anybody that wants to, we gather and it's over Zoom and we set goals right in class. So th- these are actually some plans that my, that my students have done. And they're, you know, a couple, couple page plans. And um, so this is what we do right in class. We create these. And so if you're listening to this right now and you want to get your goals set any June or any December, you just go to planningclass.com, that website, and you can register for free and you can bring your whole team with you. And if you're a sales manager, have your whole team go through the class, get their goals set and then submit them to you. And then you can go over those plans with them. And so it's just a great class. We've had a little over 10,000 people go through it through the years and something I really enjoy teaching. Beautiful. And where could people find out more about what you do in general? Yeah. So my main website's my name, ericlawfhome.com. And then uh, I'm the only Eric Lawfhome as of this <laughs> recording in the world. So if you Google me and that's all me, and so you can find me on Amazon with my books or LinkedIn or I have a YouTube channel or Facebook or, you know, whatever your favorite social media platform is, I'm likely there. So ericoffhome.com or just Google me and connect with me on whatever social media that you enjoy the most. Sure. For the links, resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast, where we'll link to, to Eric Laughlin's website and ultimately also to the link to, you know, the mid-year and annual planning event. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, a book that changed your life. Uh, E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yes, absolutely. It's my number one book still that I read. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Optimism is a learned skill. Nice. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently. I would have um, hired coaches and mentors earlier in my career. I'm in my 26th year. And had I leaned in and, and got advice from experts earlier, uh, I'm confident that I'd be a lot further along. I'm, I'm not dissatisfied with where I'm at, but I could be further along if I had taken that advice earlier. Last and final question. What's still in your bucket list to achieve? I want to get a million subscribers on my YouTube channel. Okay. So you'll come back to celebrate on the show. Okay. That sounds great. <laughs> Let's do it. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Thanks, Benny. That's my conversation with Eric Laffam. My takeaway from this one, number one, Eric emphasizes the critical role of maintaining a positive mindset in sales. He suggests the importance of being mindful of your thoughts, advising you to catch and replace negative thoughts with optimistic ones. Number two, focusing on actions rather than outcomes is another key lesson. Laffam encourages you to setting action-based goals, such as making a certain number of prospect calls daily, instead of focusing on sales numbers. Number three, 
Regular and structured planning is vital for sustained success. Eric highlights the importance of conducting mid-year and annual reviews to set and adjust your goals by using the SMART framework. You can make your goals clearer and more actionable. Number four, understanding and being flexible in the sales process is essential. Mapping out the stages of your sales process and reviewing them periodically ensures that you stay in control. And number five, effective sales management involves understanding and facilitating your sales team. Knowing what motivates each salesperson, understanding their specific challenges allows you to customize your management approach. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guest shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends and if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.